Your graphics card is probably one of the most expensive parts of your PC, and whether you game on it or just do basic word processing, it's doing millions if not trillions of graphical computations every second. Over the past decade though, graphics cards have expanded their breadth of supported operations, and can now be used as general purpose compute devices to accelerate parallelizable calculations. But what does this all mean, and how can you program for these expensive and powerful pieces of hardware? Starting off, I think it's important to say that we'll be focusing primarily on NVIDIA's CUDA API, as it's what I personally have the most experience with, and it's generally the most easy low-level parallel API to get into. I kind of want to call it the Python of parallel libraries, but at the same time there are definitely some differences. I'm assuming that you have basic knowledge of C or C++, such as how to declare variables, function declarations, pointers, and memory management. The rest I'll explain as it's an additional layer of functionality and syntax that's added with CUDA. Let's begin with some of the conceptual information though that's going to be helpful when we discuss the syntax and program structure. Let's start with what the term parallelize means. The official definition, which is to adapt specifically a program for running on a parallel processing system, is something that I personally dislike because it uses the term parallel when describing what parallel means. In a mathematical sense, you'd use the term parallel to describe an object, planar, line that runs alongside another at a constant distance and never crosses. Similarly, in a computational sense, parallel means to occur at the same time, in other words running side by side on different circuits. This is similar to a parallel circuit, which is simply two branches connected to the same two electrical nodes. They both run different currents depending on the resistance of each branch, but they have the same input voltages. We won't be discussing circuit design in this video, but when discussing parallel computational systems, it's more related to the electrical meaning of parallel, as opposed to the more textbook mathematical definition. Just for example, let's say you have two pipelines. One can do memory manipulation while the other can run arithmetic calculations. This would mean that the pipelines are running in parallel, as opposed to running down a single pipeline, which is known as serial execution, or by computer engineers as single instruction, single data, simplified down to SysD execution. Your CPU is probably the easiest example of a serial computational device. It technically can compute instructions in parallel if you utilize the multi-core nature of the chip, and even within a core, but for your everyday programs it's going to use scalar execution unless you explicitly write your software to take advantage of the extra hardware. When it comes to a parallel device, there are actually a couple different kinds of them, and your CPU also probably features instructions that allow for parallel computations. Your GPU though is the most prevalent example of a highly parallelized piece of hardware, and it can do either single instruction, multiple data, or SIMD operations, or multiple instruction, multiple data, or MIMD operations. The way that current GPUs work, they're essentially giant SIMD engines that are subdivided to allow for a MIMD type of execution. At a hardware level in NVIDIA GPUs, you've got SIMD blocks called warps, which contain 32 by 4 by wide FPUs and ALUs in Maxwell, Pascal, and Turing, and 64 FPUs and 32 ALUs for Ampere and Ada. Each CUDA core is a single 4 byte wide data path within this SIMD block, meaning that within an Ampere warp you can process 64 floats, or 32 floats and 32 ints per arithmetic instruction. Compare this to a modern CPU where you can process anywhere between 1 or 16 floats or ints per instruction depending on the instruction set that you're utilizing. AMD GPUs function almost identically, however the SIMD featured in those GPUs is a bit wider and instead operates operations on a compute unit level, as opposed to a subsystem within the compute block. This more fine-grained control of the SIMD operations allows for a better MIMD type of execution path. When a CPU core can do an operation on a single piece of data at a time, a GPU quote-unquote core can do an operation on 32 pieces of data at a time. This comes with an advantage of being able to chunk through arrays, however it also means that implementing conditional statements in a kernel can stall program execution. By the way, kernels are just small functions run on the GPU. If you want to add every other element of two arrays and let's say subtract the rest, you would have to do an add operation for the even elements, then subtract the odd elements, taking up at least two operations instead of properly MIMD parallelizing it and running them concurrently. You would instead need to run a load, a branch, and then depending on said branch, which keep in mind GPUs do not feature extensive branch prediction hardware, 
it would then have to adjust the operations it's performing and perform them across different cycles. This means that true MIMD execution in modern GPUs is really just SIMD execution that's been subdivided to allow for a MIMD data flow. However, if you write your software to avoid running different operations at the same time, the advantages brought on by this approach to hardware design is incredibly evident if you've been paying attention to the hardware scene over the past 10 or so years. These are graphics cards after all, and within shaders, you don't really use if statements too much, and it's more just repetitive simple operations. Besides the shader cores, your GPU features lots of other hardware that's needed for rasterizing and texturing 3D worlds. But in this video, we're going to be ignoring them for the most part, and will instead be sticking to the GPU as a general purpose compute device. Without anything else hardware related to cover, let's dive into the syntax and explore what a CUDA program looks like and how it's structured. To get started, you'll need to install a CUDA toolkit. In this video, we'll be using version 12, which features the new instructions and functions found in Ampere and Ada. And we'll also be integrating it into Visual Studio 2022. A link to download this version of the CUDA toolkit will be in the description below, and it's pretty straightforward once you download and unzip the package. Once you've got everything installed, you can create a new CUDA runtime project, and it should give you this default file with the main function, a helper function, and then a kernel. This file is a good place to start exploring from, because it has all the functionality and code that are the best practices for picking up CUDA. Usually though, when I create a project, I delete this default file and replace it with my own file structure, which can realistically be anything that you want. As for the files that need to be included, you simply need to use an include statement for these two files, CUDA runtime.h and device launch parameters.h. These two files are the CUDA runtime functions and such, along with the syntax changes used to launch GPU functions, known as kernels. Just for example, this is what a basic header file for a CUDA project would look like. It only contains the CUDA import statements, a vector type file that comes with CUDA, and then the C++ IO stream. I also wrote this function to wrap our function calls with, since functions from the CUDA library return a CUDA error t enumeration, and it just checks this and logs errors to the console. This will become very helpful in the future, and I cannot stress this enough. When I was first learning CUDA, my programs just wouldn't work, and I'd have no idea where to even start looking for issues. This safe call function just wraps CUDA API calls and is there to help when things go wrong. It literally only activates when it's not a successful call. Now let's move into the actual function header, which contains declarations for actual CUDA kernels. In this header, demo.cuh, we've got three kernel and two helper function declarations, with the kernels denoted by the underscore underscore global tag immediately before declaring the kernel. A few things to keep in mind though about kernels. Number one, they always have a void return type. Different from shaders and something like DirectX 12 or OpenGL, kernels instead use pointers passed to them to store values that should be returned. You'll see with the first kernel declaration, we've got a dot product function that takes in two flow three pointers, which are just arrays of 3D vectors, and then stores the resulting scalars in a third float array. You'll also note that there's the const keyword before the float three pointer, and this indicates that the memory is intended to be read only. This is something I like about CUDA because with OpenCL and Sickle, you have to explicitly tell the device what memory is read only and then what memory is write only. And if you pass a read-only piece of memory into a function that needs to write to it, you're just SOL and it doesn't work. Meanwhile, CUDA treats memory on the GPU similar to how a CPU treats the heap. It can be malloced and freed, and something being read-only can be denoted at the function level, rather than at the pointer level. You can still create read-only memory in a program by also using the const keyword, but it functions identically to how regular C and C++ work. So if you're familiar with the syntax and logic of it, it'll transfer over effortlessly. This is also how you, quote, return values without using the return keyword. Number two, kernel calls only support C language features. This means that STD vector doesn't work with kernels, though there is the thrust vector library available. and also means that things such as iterators can't be accessed and regular object-oriented programming is more difficult since you'll need to deep copy everything from the host to the device. On top of that, memory malloced on the device can only be accessed by said device and kernels, and can't be accessed by the host. There is a way to get around this using CUDA malloc managed, however we won't be using that in this video. Number 3. Speaking of the host and the device, what does this mean? 
Well, your host in this case is the CPU, and it's what dispatches instructions to the device, which in this case is the GPU. Functions written for the host cannot be run on the device, and similarly, functions written on the device cannot be run on the host. Something like this function. It's a device function where it takes in an integer, squares it, and then returns an integer. This can only be run on the GPU. Meanwhile, functions such as the helper function in this file can only be run on the CPU. When programming for CUDA, you'll get very familiar with these two functions, CUDA malloc and CUDA memcopy, probably along with CUDA free. However, we'll get to that later in the video. You could also use CUDA malloc managed. However, in this video, we'll be focusing on doing memory manipulation ourselves so that we can better understand as to how your program is working. Starting with CUDA malloc, this function is simple and takes two parameters, a cast void double pointer, and then an unsigned eight byte wide integer. The pointer is what allows you to access the memory that you're mallocing, while the unsigned int is what's taking in how many bytes you want to malloc, similar to how malloc works in C. It would read something like, allocate memory on this device with this pointer as a reference with this many bytes reserved. My RTX 3070 Ti has eight gigs of memory on board, so you can malloc up to around 7.8 gigabytes before it starts throwing memory errors, and it's dependent on the model of card that you get. However, if successful, you should now be able to copy data from the host array to the malloc device using CUDA memcopy. This function is a little harder to get the hang of, but it's not that bad once you pick up on how it works. The first parameter is the destination pointer. If you're copying from the host to the device, you would put the device pointer as the first argument since that's where the data is going to. Meanwhile, if you're copying data from the device to the host, you would put the host pointer as the first argument. The second pointer is the source. So keeping with the example of copying from the host to the device, you would put the host pointer as the second parameter. The third parameter, like the second parameter of CUDA malloc, tells the function how many bytes to copy. If you want to transfer a single float, you'd probably put just size of float as the third parameter, whereas if you were trying to copy an entire array of floats, you'd then multiply the size of the float by the size of your array. Keep in mind though that C, unlike Java, doesn't store the length of an array with set array, so you'll have to keep track of it somewhere in your program. Now with the fourth and final parameter, it's an enumeration telling the function which way the data is flowing. There are five different enums related to this, I believe, but I could be wrong and they're on screen now. What you'll be using the most though is probably CUDA memcopy device to host and CUDA memcopy host to device, as they're the two most common operations. Other types include device to device memory transfers and host to host memory transfers, along with one called CUDA memcopy default, which I've personally never used, so I can't really speak as to how useful it is. Either way, you'd be using primarily these two enums I brought up, but it's just nice to know that the other ones exist too. Keep in mind, you'll have to do this every time you want to copy a chunk of data to and from the device. Instructs can be used to help simplify this instead of manually writing every line every time. Now that you've allocated the memory and copied over the data, how do you actually write code for the GPU? Well, you first use a pair of triple brackets like this and inside your device tell how many blocks you'd like to run across, as well as how many threads you'd like to launch per block. It can be thought of as launching the same function on every element of a two-dimensional array. Once you get into the function, you'll see the first thing that you need to do is to tell the function where it is in the array of threads. The first three lines here get the y position of the specific function in the 2D array, the x position in the same way, then takes these two values and flattening them into one so that we can access the single one-dimensional array that we passed in. The reason that this is being done is for performance and shader occupancy. The optimal amount of threads per block will change depending on the microarchitecture that your GPU supports, so you can realistically change this to any number that you'd like. I just have it set to 128 since it's a nice round computer number. Once we've flattened the 2D indices into a 1D index, we can now do the actual computation on the numbers. For this function, which calculates the dot product of two input vectors and saves it into a third scalar output, you access the target element of the past in arrays by using the 1D index we just calculated, and then you can access each element of the vectors independently. These operations are performed in parallel, which is why you need to index where in the array the function is. If you don't include the index, your kernel won't be able to know where it's supposed to do the operation. In fact, if you pass in a pointer and don't reference it like an array, it won't even compile properly and it'll usually throw an error. However, for performing more complex functions, such as pre-processing an image, 
You can use for loops within these kernels to go through rows and columns of pixels to add them up. Here's a more complex kernel than the dot product I showed earlier, but you can see all the basics here. There's the indexing, then there's the actual calculation of the array values, and then storing the result from stead computation into the output array. Keep in mind that you can also pass in a single variable instead of a pointer, however it'll be treated as a constant, and using an ampersand won't really allow you to work around that. It's generally not seen as the best practice in CUDA, but it works if you're in a pinch and have a value that remains constant throughout your program's execution. Now that your kernel is written, you can head back to the helper function. Immediately after your kernel call, you want to put a CUDA device synchronize call to ensure that the device has finished processing the past array. And then you'll copy the data you want back from the device into the host memory using another CUDA mem copy call, except this time setting the enumeration to CUDA mem copy device to host. You'll also want to put the host pointer as the destination and the device pointer as the source, which will give the GPU locations from which to copy the data and then to store it. I can't believe I left this out of the original script and have to edit this in post-production, but for the love of God, please do not forget to free your variables. Now there's one thing that you should include in your program, usually in your main function. This one right here, CUDA set device, which allows you to choose which device you'd like to run your code on. Since most users only have a single GPU, you'd usually just put in zero as it's the first value. But if you have multiple cards and want to pick one over the other, then other integer values can be input as well. Now that you've got everything set up, your program should compile. If you want to see your GPU working hard, string multiple of these kernel calls together and don't synchronize them until you either have to because you're passing its values into another function or have finished all the calls. This will allow your GPU to work uncapped and if the temperature of your GPU goes up, you know that it's working and actually running on the circuitry on the GPU. Or perhaps you're writing an image processing algorithm. You can use CUDA to accelerate the calculations and then fill in the pixel values of a graph to make sure the data is where you want it to be. Just as an example, here's an X and Y axis graph for a video of my guinea pig just kind of walking around my room. This is what you could use CUDA for, to accelerate thousands if not millions of calculations being conducted each frame. It allows for a real-time, roughly 15 FPS analysis, whereas on the CPU with AVX 512, you're lucky to get around 2 or 3, because there's just so many nested for loops. It's a huge speedup, but I do admit it can be improved. In all, CUDA is an interesting new way to write programs and attain performance from someone who was traditionally taught a very scalar, single-threaded execution type of coding. This approach incorporates many of the scalar techniques and almost all the syntax, However, it does it in a way that's pretty novel and is an interesting way to program. It's ultimately just implementing an algorithm and data structures in C, which, if you know how to do the basics with it, CUDA won't be difficult to pick up from a syntax perspective. What may need more time though is the change of perspective that writing for a massively parallel piece of hardware requires. The problems being computed on a GPU need to be parallelizable, and even though some tasks translate really well to GPUs, others may not. For example, if you're implementing decision-making logic for something like a robot, you wouldn't use a GPU. It's just not worth parallelizing something like that, even if it could be done properly. Think of the GPU as a compute accelerator for the CPU as opposed to a replacement for your CPU. Your CPU needs to make all the decisions about what to run, and the GPU acts as a massive coprocessor to offload simple, parallelizable tasks. It's called a graphics card after all, so that's what its primary purpose is. However, it also serves as a very useful tool for programmers looking to attain higher performance from their code. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you think about Kudo because I'm honestly kind of interested to see what you guys have to say. If you want more coding kind of syntax analysis and tutorials almost, let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to make more of them. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.